Okay, so in a chapter before, we talked a little bit about how the information that is within the self, that is within the self-concept, is structured. The different aspects, the traits, the roles, uh, the different perspectives we can have on ourselves. Now we want to talk a little bit about the information that is within these structures. How do we fill it over our lifetime with information? What kind of information is in there? And we want to kind of start by looking at a popular <laughs> myth, maybe, right? Where basically in order to find yourself, you have to leave society behind. You have to go into the wilderness like this woman and you stand there and you stare into the abyss and thereby you will reflect on yourself and you will discover your true self what is truly within you um, but I think there's uh, pro there's a lot of things that are flawed with this idea and I think, as you can see by the end of this chapter and by the end of the sec next chapter, is that if we remove society from us, there's not that much to be discovered. One of the key problems of this idea of finding yourself by basically reflecting on yourself is the idea that I can have via introspection insights into what I like, what I don't like, who I want to be, who I don't want to be, and who I am. Um, and there's a famous article uh, by Nisbet and Wilson where they in detail uh, describe why people are so bad at introspection and we talk a little bit later in our social psychology course about this model that Nesbitt and Wilson proposing so I won't talk too much about it here but I just want to give you one kind of quick intuition so there's uh, for a long time I don't know if people are still doing it it was kind of like you were when you lived in the US you were either a coke guy or a Pepsi guy you like coke or you like Pepsi and people thought of themselves oh I like more coke i like more pepsi so what um, you can do and i think you will easily understand why i'm using this example is you can bring people in a lap and let them drink a bit of coke and a bit of pepsi and if they're in the right uh cans there's like oh i like coke mm. and there's like why do you like coke i think coke is not too sweet but it has a little bit sweet has the hint of cinnamon and so forth i don't know what people are saying but that's probably something they were saying but when we would switch the um, label and we would serve the Pepsi and the Coke can and the, can, uh, the Coke and a Pepsi can, people just go by the can, right? It's not that they have true insight into why they like something. They would probably insist and believe that they like the taste of Coke, but something else is going on. Somehow they acquired a, a liking for Coke over Pepsi that seems to be largely associated with the label, not the taste, and yet we don't really have any insights in them. If I would ask him why we switched this, why do you said Coke, then they would might be embarrassed and say, like, oh, I made a mistake, I was misled by the label and so forth, but we don't have a good insight into why we like the things we like or why we we do the things we do one radical approach is uh, in uh, saying like okay so let's say we don't have any liking or disliking in ourselves how do we learn to kind of say that we like something or we don't like something and um bam proposed the self-perception theory to kind of explain it. and he said well just like we look at other people and see what they're doing oh i see um candace is stroking a cat seems like candace likes cats oh i see peter he looks after the dog seems like Peter likes the dog you look at yourself and it's like oh uh, I don't like either cats or dogs I don't have a cat or a dog seems like I'm not a pet person and then you believe you're not a pet person and boom by observing yourself by observing what you're doing you take inferences about who you are so here's a study which I always quite like, which has kind of uh, a long-standing implications for a lot of areas of our lives, but also helps to try to understand how we make these kind of self-perception attributions when we observe our own behavior. So in the study done by Lepper et al. In, in the early uh, 1970s, they went into a kindergarten, and so like a nursery or a daycare, uh, children were about four to five years old, and they brought with the magic markers fantastic crayons all the kids seem to like oh look at these crayons okay so then they divided the uh, children into two groups in one group they just let the 
children play with the crayons. They didn't do anything. They didn't give them anything. They didn't give them any praise. They just let them play for 20 minutes with the crayons, then took the crayons away and left. In the other group, the children played with the crayons, but before they got promised, if you play for 20 minutes with these crayons, then you get a reward. It was quite cute. They got a, a star and a document for excellent magic crayon player. So they got recognition. They got that from their teacher. So um, they were super happy that they got this reward. So now, two weeks later, the same group of researchers gave, uh, came back and gave the children the magic crayons. And what you can see is that the children who didn't get any reward for playing with these magic crayons, right? They played much longer with the crayons than the children who got the reward for playing with the magic crayons. And the idea is that the children in the first group, the group that didn't get any rewards, they observed themselves and said, like, huh, okay, so it seems like I enjoy playing this. Uh, it seems like I like playing with magic crayons and hence I keep on doing that. The next chance I have to play magic crayons, then I will play magic crayons again. So often this is referred to kind of using the intrinsic motivation, you attribute it to something in yourself and hence you uh, uh, observe or perceive yourself now that you have the attitude towards liking um, these crayons. And in the other group, on a, a contrast, they played with the magic crayons. Which like, huh, why did I play with the magic crayons? Oh, I played with the magic crayons because I got promised this reward, I got this reward. Seems like without a reward, I don't really like magic crayons. So even though the children both started with the same kind of intrinsic interest in playing with these crayons, by creating these two different situations under which they played, they took very different um, ideas away from it about whether they like crayons or not. So this is basically kind of in line with Ben's idea about the uh, self-perception theory. And he says like, well, if we perceive ourselves in a situation where we are kind of forced to do something, we don't like doing that. But if we are perceived to, uh, in our session to do something that we were not to force, that we did on our own without any reward or um, kind of hope for reward, then we think, oh, I like that, okay? So basically we observe ourselves just just how we would observe others and then conclude our attitudes. And when we have them, then we stick to them. Another really important one, right, in trying to understand who we are and whether we're good or not, whether we're intelligent or not, whether we're beautiful or not, whether we're, we're worthy or not, is social comparison, right? Just like you kind of try to figure out um, if something is something worth by comparing it to. For instance, you might think like, ah, oh, is this a good car? And then if it's on its own, you're just like, mm, I don't know, it looks kind of okay. But then you see it uh, next to a brand new shiny car, it's like, oh, this car is not good. Good, right? Can you immediately see by comparing one thing to the other that you determine the value? And often this is in our lives, right? What is the objective measurement for intelligence, for being good at psychology, for being funny, for being a good driver and so forth? So what we do is we constantly compare ourselves to others in order to understand, okay, um, am I intelligent? Am I good at psychology? Am I a good, good driver? So just as we don't know if we only see a woman running on their own, whether she's fast or not, or she's one of the fastest in the world, by comparing them with each other, we learn. And so we learn to uh, also about ourselves by some social comparison. So we constantly look out to compare ourselves with others. And there are two key comparisons, right? So let's say you are here and you just won a silver medal um, at the Olympics, okay? So now you have two choices. You can either compare yourself upward, you can say like, ah, oh, damn it, I didn't win gold, okay? So you have an upward comparison, and hence you might not feel that happy, and she doesn't indeed, she doesn't look very happy, or she could compare herself to the third place and say, like, ha, I'm better than bronze. I got silver, I didn't get gold. By downward comparison, that might us make us happy. So there are these two types of comparison and it depends a little bit on the situation. So it seems like that what often happens, and this is the study my um, Medvek and colleagues, where they looked at basically how happy uh, silver and bronze medalists were. And so they coded the faces of these medalists. And what they found is that silver medalists are less happy or appear to be less happy, at least on these pictures, they smile less than 
a bronze medalist. And the idea here is that as a silver medalist, it's like, oh, I was so close to winning. Okay, so you make an upward comparison. But she, smiling here, she's happy because she's like, oh, I, I just got in. I was about to not get anything. So she does a downward comparison to the fourth place. And hence, she feels pretty happy about herself. And that's the same mechanism people use. There's like in certain situations, we feel compelled to do upward or downward comparison. And one has this kind of um, uh, idea to we it can motivate us and uh, kind of uh, 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 lead to more ambitious, right? We can be more ambitious, which is like, oh, I could do, do better, but it's also bad for our maybe self-esteem, for our self-perception. And then downward comparison help us to feel good about ourselves. And this is something most people do more often than upward comparison because they want to feel good about themselves.